put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version, and the link is in the description box. Red Orchestra 2 Heroes of Stalingrad video game review. The Eastern Front was one of the worst parts of the Second World War. It has been said of it that a German died every seven seconds of the long battles. And it was even worse for the Russians. And the, the goal of this game, and the first one, is to put you right there. And they really accomplished that. Now, the, this one has a single player. And it very clearly is not the focus, but it's still well done. Basically, it doesn't really have characters or plot in the traditional sense, especially not characters. Technically, the players, every soldier that he responds as. And really, the, the, the story, it's, it's somewhat like a real-time strategy game's story. It's all about the battle. No other than maybe StarCraft, but yeah, it's it's all about the battles and how they are decisive in, in one way or another. So, you know, a couple of levels in a row might be, you know, level one is you are taking this important, you know, area in of, of the Eastern Front, and level two is they're trying to take it back, and now you have to defend it. And, and yeah, overall, it is kind of the, the overall battle of the, the Eastern Front. There's a reason why the, the, the two campaigns, the, the two different sides, the second one is the Soviet one, because, spoiler alert, the Germans did not take and keep the the yeah they they suffered pretty substantial losses and yeah it was it was very much just a a, a pride thing for for both sides really that the the symbolic you know who who has Stalingrad basically now. The, the single player is only seven hours long, and again, it's, it's sort of a practicing ground, and it is, the, the levels are the same as the, the maps in multiplayer. In fact, they are, a lot of these games will have levels in single player that are essentially, I mean, I just recently reviewed Sniper Elite V2, the levels in there and the maps and multiplayer are roughly the same, but the single player puts up barriers and, you know, spawns enemies specifically. In this, it is literally just you're playing these same levels and they are played the same way as, as one of the modes of, of, you know, it's all about taking and or keeping the, the, the different areas of the of, of the levels but yeah you know you you start the same place that you would in multiplayer the the level ends the same place as in multiplayer what the the single player does in in addition to being a training ground is it puts these levels in context and that really is 
it, it's really uh, it's gripping. And again, it is these two games are entirely about putting you there. About it's it's somewhat like interactive documentary. You you realize just how bad it was, and yeah, and and the the sort of like I said, one level might be you taking an area, the next level might be you having to defend it. You you do get something of an idea of how sort of how meaningless it, it was. Like, like I said, it was all about the, the pride of Stalin and Hitler. And yeah, it's it's really well done. Now the, the single player has these these sort of cutscenes. They're they're really briefings and like epilogues to to the the chapters. Each the, the two campaigns have twelve levels each, and the twelve levels are divided into eight chapters. And yeah, relatively self contained. Yeah. And the end of a campaign typically has a letter from someone on the Eastern Front read, al read aloud. And yeah, it's, it's, it's truly compelling. And these, these letters are entirely, yeah, that, you know, actual letters. And yeah, now the, the briefings and epilogues are put together of historical footage and these attack plan animations, you know, the where they'll show the map and like, okay, we're coming in from here and they're defending this this area and you have to, you know, and then you move on to this next area, that kind of thing. And and there are actually there are these little propaganda images in there. As well as these, you know, th there are actual Russian, you know, place names and the like, and they really, they literally are written in Russian. And it's not, you know, you don't have to read it to understand. Again, it's it's about putting you there. You don't have to understand. In, in that case, you don't have to really understand. And, yeah, the, the propaganda, like, the the Germans will present, represent the, 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 the Soviets as these ravenous wolves, like blood, you know, dripping from their mouths and, like, crazy eyes. And the, the Soviets will show the, the Germans as basically there's this one image where it's it's the swastika and one of the ends is like the head of a snake. You know that yeah those two images really sum it up. Now there are some tutorials in this and that was something I really you know missed in the first one. And a couple of them are really good. I'll I'll get to the ones that that aren't the 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 better ones really show you a lot of I mean in addition to just telling you the basics so you know literally the first thing you do in you know when you start the single player campaign is just okay run okay crouch you know that whole thing this is how you move the camera you know that kind of basic but then you are you know of course, there's the, the target range. Then you're asked to kind of follow the, the rules of these different guns. You, you are given, for, for example, of one of the, the things you have to be aware of is a machine gun barrel might overheat, and you'll have to exchange the barrel. Now, 
this in and of itself is not hard to do, but if you're discovering that in the heat of battle, you know, overheated magazine or barrel, heat of the battle, you know, give me a hot minute. How do you deal with that? And yeah, the tutorial tells you, okay, this is going to happen, and this is how you deal with it. And that really helps tremendously. Now, the and and yeah, and in general, the the single player is you know every every unit that you, that isn't you is a bot, and that you know you can also go and practice multiplayer with bots just in in general, you know, and. There, there can be bots to the, you know, just a regular multiplayer match might have bots. And the bots can be good. A bit of the time they are. But when they're bad, they are really bad. Yeah. Some quick examples. I lost count of how many both on my side and the enemy side would literally just stand and not do anything. Might not even be in cover. A lot of them would aim directly into a wall or a different obstacle. The tank ones are... <laughs> like, you, you can order the, the people in your tank around. If, if you're, I think it's called a tank commander. They're not necessarily going to follow your orders, though. And sometimes they might, like, follow them, but they're going to be extremely stupid about it. Like, I had them, like, you know, okay, let's, you know, turn to the left and, you know, just full ahead, you know, speed up because we have a bit of ground to cover. A few seconds later, it occurred to me, they're literally going to drive the tank smack into the side of that building. So I had to, like, you know, immediately tell them, okay, reverse, turn to the other side, and, you know. And this is just, this, again, in the heat of battle, this is not something you should have to deal with. You might as well be driving the tank yourself at that point. And yeah, the idea is someone drives the tank, someone else mans the gun. And yeah. Now, before I move too much on from the tutorials, the, the, the worst ones are the, the ones for the tank and for explosives. Now, basically, the one for explosives, let's, I'm, I'm going to start by setting up some, some ground rules for the, the weaknesses of the tutorials. They don't really give you enough freedom to, excuse me, experiment. And this is this is sadly something that's pretty common to tutorials is they don't really give you the 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 freedom and you, you know where you can just run around try out the different guns and, or at least the 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 most common guns and you could you know yeah you could you could get accustomed to how yeah how how it moves and in you know basically like yeah there's target practice but there's only you know you're only shooting at you know non moving targets the There are a couple of different ranges, but yeah, and and it it sort of it has you going through these 
in in a linear fashion. So if you're you know by the end of it and you haven't you know you you feel like you know or yeah by the end of it there's something near the end that you really want to practice more at you may have to play the whole one over again now so yes the the explosives one basically it tells you first and foremost how to deal with tanks it does also you know it's, it starts with you blowing up a wall which yeah that can be really useful you know tactically speaking like okay do you wanna run around a wall or do you just go through the hole and so you know if you're defending keep them away from you know the places they can blow a hole in them you know if you see an engineer, shoot him, you know. And if you are an engineer on the attacking side, you know, be careful and head straight for these, you know, the where you can blow up. For example, you know, blow a hole in a wall. Yeah, etc. Now, yeah, the, but the main thing is, how do you deal with tanks? And first, it'll show you how to use the anti-tank grenade, and that's that's fine. That's you know, there's really no problem there. But then it shows you how to deal with the. I'm probably going to get this wrong. I think it's PTRD, which is an anti-tank rifle. It's not it's not a rocket launcher or something. It's it fires shells. That, I'm I'm terrible. Let's. At, the details are such, but it, it fires shells that can penetrate the armor of tanks. And the thing here is, the game actually, I mean, for one thing, the, the tanks have a, they, they take damage based on the, the angle and, I think the other one is called Penetration. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to the, the the details of that one, but what I'm getting at is it's not just pointed. You know, you have first-person shooters where full respect to first-person shooters, but in a lot of them, you do just you know fire a rocket at a vehicle and it blows up. In this game, you have to aim for weak points. You may you won't be able to penetrate the armor just anywhere. And even if you do, you might just lightly damage it. And, you know, now the tank knows you're there. So, yeah. And the game doesn't really tell you what the weak points are. And, again, it's a static target. It's only from the side. You know, it... If you're if you're up against a tank and and it's not you know from the side, you just have to yeah you you have to pick it up in the heat of battle. Where exactly should I aim and yeah this this kind of thing. It doesn't give you more ammo if you happen to spend all your ammo and not destroy the tank. And again, then you just have to restart the whole thing. And it doesn't tell you what you did wrong. It doesn't, like, if you hit the tank, it'll say you hit the tank. It, if you miss it, it won't say why you missed it or by how much. When you hit it, if you destroy something, it'll say you destroyed that thing. But you don't get, like, a, a diagram of the tank with, like, you know, just highlight the area that I hit or something like that. So, yeah, a bunch of these things you just have to pick up in the field. And the field is obviously where you get some of the, you know, that's, that's final exams, you might say. That's where you pick up some of the most important stuff. But it is important to give you a good ground for, you know, before you go. Bef yeah, 
because otherwise there's just too much that you have to pick up in the heat of battle. The, you know, I mean, even beyond, you know, first-person shooters now have recoil and, you know, you can only sprint for so long and, and such. But in this one, you have to... A lot of the rifles, you can dial the, the distance that you shoot at. You know, so some of them go as far as in, in 100 meter increments from 100 meters all the way up to 2,000 meters. And yeah, this is the kind of thing that you, you really need to know and really need to master. And it's like, you know, I don't have very good depth perception. If you don't, and, and if you also don't, it's going to be a little difficult to, to properly adjust to it. And like I said, not all of the guns can can be adjusted to the same, you know. Yeah, you know, some of them will only go to like 300 or 500. And this is the kind of thing that you really want to know before you have the rifle in your hands and you are going out into battle. And again, if, if it would let you familiarize yourself with the different guns, then you would have a better grip on, does this rifle need me to bolt after you know every shot? What is the basic clip size of this? Because again, if you were having to count your bullets once you're in the battle, you know, even even at first, just to figure out, okay, how often should I expect to have to reload this gun? Yeah, it's a bit too much. Like someone said about the first game that it's kind of a, you know, jump in the water and see if you can swim. I, I would basically agree, and in this one, I would kind of almost say it's, it's that and add to it that you've never used your legs or arms before. So, yeah, you're probably going to drown. And, yeah, a lot of people will find this prohibitively, prohibitively difficult just from that, you know. It's... And, and yeah, and it's a real shame because the game is amazing once you actually really get, you know, once you get past the, the horribly, you know, t t how terrifying it is at first. Because there are so many things that you have to deal with for, for that. And... Now the, I think that more or less covers that. I, sh I should say about the, the single player campaigns, both of them have just one voice and it's like a superior officer. And something that's really great is the first time you hear the German one, again the, the German campaign is the first of the two. The first time you hear that officer, he is literally barking orders at you as you're running through this basic training thing. So, yeah, that really sets the, you know, yeah, you are, you are not being coddled here. And, yeah, the, the one voice of the superior officer is, is constant throughout. You know, they, they're briefing you on battle plans. They are, you know, they, they read the... The, the letters, and in general, deal with epilogues. Oh, some of the epilogues is just, this is what happened with that battle kind of thing. Now, this comes with a demo for Rising Storm. I don't review demos, so now the... I suppose that brings us nicely into just the, the the levels themselves. Several of them are entirely based on real life locations, including Pavlov's house and 
the Red October Factory, I think it's called. And yeah, the levels are all fan you know excellent in design. The you know big enough that flanking is is possible and extremely useful. And often the objectives will be towards the middle, both horizontally and vertically, of the map. So yeah, you can you can flank all the way around and some of the you know first and last of the of these objectives, you know, again an objective is an area that has to be captured or defended or the like. And yeah, the, the first and last of these objectives may be towards the you know all the way up towards the the wall, either vertically or horizontally, of the level. So yeah, that one not as possible to do flanking and thus intensifying the battle. Now the I suppose the the basic different different game modes are, are good to get into. And this is a huge improvement from the first. In general this is this is the blade of, of sequels, much like you know Snapple League V2. It has all of the strengths, none of the weaknesses. Well, this more so than, than Snapple League V2. And in this one also several new positives. Like if they had just done the first again, just with all these, you know, all this refining and and such, that would have been fine. You know, I would have, you know, shouted its name from the rooftops, enjoy, but they actually add new stuff. And this new stuff, at first glance, it might look like it's making the game too too easy. I, whenever I approach a sequel to a very tough game, especially something that has stealth and, and sniping and, and that sort of thing, I'm always wary of does this make it too easy? You know, is this Hitman Sound Assassin? Does it does it go for the mainstream instead of just really serving that niche? And I, I appreciate that sometimes the niche, you know, but at the same time, I really hate especially with something like Hitman Solid Assassin because it goes so far to the mainstream that you know you might as well just be playing a different game. You know, it, it loses too much of its personality, and the appeal of the first one was that it was so so challenging. Now, yes, what, what I'm getting at is this game does not do that. There are there are new things, but they are not making it too easy. Basically, these sort of things like uh, I already mentioned, you know, dialing the the gun for. I'm doing this. I have no idea how they actually do it. It it yeah, dialing the gun for how far, you know. Yeah, what what exact, you know, what what average distance? You know, in the first one, this was only for the Panzerfaust, and in this one, it's. I think more or less every rifle. I don't, you know, have. I can't pick apart every single one, but yeah, the the, yeah, and then you have, you know, you can now vault, which that was something you really missed being able to do in the first one, and again, this doesn't make it too easy. It just gives new tactical opportunities. It means you don't have to go all the way around that, you know line of, of, I think, sandbags, whatever they're called, you know, you don't have to find the stairwell, you know, in and out of the, you know, in the old in-out club of the, of, of the trenches, you can just climb immediately. And, yeah, while this at first might seem, you know, 
does this make it too easy? Remember, the enemy can do the exact same thing. So, yeah, it it's and I yeah I think that more or less gives you an an idea of the basic yeah. Now, <coughs> excuse me. The Yeah, so so the yeah the, the new additions, I think that more or less covers that aspect. And yeah, and this doesn't make it easier, but it does have options for those who want, you know, who really do want this kind of game, but it is just too difficult for them. There are three. I suppose you could call them difficulty. The the bots have four difficulty settings, which also means the single player has four difficulty settings, and the the servers have three different. I think they're called server rules, so that's what I'm going with. And they are from from least to most mainstream, classic realism and action, and. Classic is what is just what it says on the tin. It's basically the first game of you know as far as how how detailed and and how careful you have to be. It's it's described in in the game as slower pace and more things you have to keep track of basically. And yeah, that's very much true. Not everyone is gonna want to play. This one, and you know, full respect to that. I mean, yeah. What what I'm instead of me just repeating this over and over, I mean no disrespect to to those who find this too difficult. I just barely get past. I I'm not saying it is any kind of insult. I'm just. Being being pragmatic and objective, I'm just saying it is this difficult. Whereas and and you know away from the mainstream, whereas yeah, your your mainstream first person shooters are less difficult and more to the mainstream. There's there's less stuff to keep track of. Let's go with that because they're not necessarily easy, you know. And yeah, so and then you have realism, which takes away some of the most, you know, again, you know, these the things that might really just scare you off at, at first light. I mean, this is very much a game that you do not just sit down and play this game. This is a game where, I mean, before you can even join a match, you have to get in and just learn a bunch of different controls. And I will get brief into the controls briefly but shortly, briefly and shortly, the final mode action is closer to your typical first person shooter. And again, that is, you know, the, the game shouldn't be completely impossible to play for those who want that. And, you know, when you're choosing servers, I mean, you can put on the filter that says, I only want to play classic if that's it, or I only want to play, you know, action or realism. So, yeah. Now the I suppose that more or less covers that. So yes, the the controls. I swear I will get to the different game modes as well. Yes, the the controls. They have been streamlined some, which is fantastic, but there's still a lot. There's still a bit of way to go, and. That's really unfortunate because this is one of the aspects that are really like a lot of the other things. You spend a bit of time, you learn. You know, it's like okay, I get how I'm supposed to deal with this now. You know, you you adjust to bolting after you know individual bullets are fired. You adjust to counting your shots yourself because the game is not going to tell you how many bullets are left because that's not realistic. So you know, if you're like Sniping or just have a general rifle. 
you want to know how many bullets are in that clip before you even start firing, and you want to count every single bullet, or you're going to be someone, you know, aiming at someone, lining up that perfect shot, click, no bullets in the clip, and yeah, that you want to avoid that. That's something you get used to over the course of playing this game. But <laughs> having to deal with all these different you know, keys, that is something that it's never quite going to be addressed by how long you play. There's, there's still way too many keys to keep track of. And basically the, the, the solution that there could be is if holding down one button toggles the function of another button. You know, I, I like to use the, the Batman Arkham game, or the, the first two at least. I haven't played beyond those two. While there's definitely not a ton of different, you know, I mean, basically there's like, a handful of buttons other than, you know, the the one to eight buttons for, you know, selecting gadgets. But there's not a lot of different keys there. But the ones that there are, they do really great at. Like in that game, if you're, you know, if you're opening a grate that you're going to be climbing under, first you press crouch, you know, you hold down crouch, and then you press the jump button. So you can't accidentally open that grate, because if you're just crouching, you know, why would you press the jump button unless to, to open that thing? And, you know, if you're, you know, running around or jumping around, you're also not going to be opening that grate because you're not pressing crouch. This game really needs something like that, you know, and, and it would be possible, but they, they did not quite do enough streamlining. Now, the streamlining, these are things like that, where in the first one, the, the you know, replace overheated barrel, that had its own key, which is just insane. In this one, it's alternate option for the, the, the weapon. And I'm pretty sure it's been over a while since I had to replace one of these, but yeah. This button also lets you choose whether it's, you know, choose between semi and semi and fully automatic. And in the case of the sniper, you, you, it actually has an iron sight. I love this. It is, it is just fantastic because a sniper might have someone come close to him, and you don't want to just shoot from the hip. So, you know, now obviously the scope is just going to be way too much, so it has an iron sight. So you can literally be looking beneath the, the you know, it's, it is so beneath the scope to, you know, be looking through this iron sight. And it's, it's like, it's just, you know, a regular rifle now. So if they are, you know, fairly close to you, you can still use the sniper to take them out. You know, you don't have to really scramble to, you know, get to the the, you know, get to the chopper or the pistol in this case. And yeah, this helps tremendously. The use button now can it doesn't have to. You can set it to three different keys. Can resupply of a friend or in general just use. You know, it can be resupply. It can be use radio. You know, pick up gun various things, pick up slash swap gun. It can also engage or disengage cover, and the, let's see, there's, there's at least one more, which escapes me at the moment, but, and this brings me very nicely into the cover. I think that more or less covers the, the streamlining of controls. At least it gives you a general idea of there's a lot of streamlining controls here, but still not enough. And it is because the game is so dedicated to being a simulation to actually getting every single detail in there that they possibly can that it makes it difficult to streamline these controls. Now, the cover system, I know I'm, I'm just showering this game with praise, but to be fair, I did start off with talking about how even with the 
inclusion of tutorials, this game is still, you know, way too hard to get into. So I've I've saved up some praise. The cover system is the best cover system I have ever seen. Now I I can appreciate that I have not played that many of these games that have cover systems, but of the ones I've played, this is by far the best. You can cover behind almost anything that you know is just is tall enough. You you know. And you know there are a couple of things where you may not be able to you know engage the cover. There's an icon, so you always know whether you can engage the cover once you're standing in front of it or not. There are a couple of places where the the shooting above cover will get a little wonky. I don't quite know why, but it will have you aiming into the cover instead. And this happens in some other games as well. But here, you can just disengage the cover and use, you know, crouch and prone to be able to shoot up above it. And, you know, it's, it's not the best solution, but it's a solution. You're not, you know, completely screwed in that scenario. Then you have the fact that you can, you know, you can always blind fire. You can even toss a grenade from just blind fire. And, you know, whenever you use a grenade, by the way, you can toss it or you can, you know, underhand roll kind of thing, you know, huge difference in how far it'll go and how, you know, yeah, self-explanatory. Now, the, the, you know, beyond the blind fire, you can at any time lean to the side of, of a cover or, you know, duck up above the cover and go back down without even having, having your weapon out. You can also do it with having your weapon out. Whenever you are in cover, you can brace the gun, you know, rest slash brace, you know, either, you know, against any surface that is that is relatively flat. You know, horizontal, vertical, I'm saying you know a lot. You know? It, bracing slash resting takes away the, the, you know, unsteady hold you have on the rifle, which, you know, is obviously going to get worse if you're, if you're, like, running or the like. And, yeah, it helps tremendously. So your, your best position is probably going to be, you know, static and using cover or at least close to cover. In fact, the, the best way to ensure that you're hitting everything you're aiming at as far as, you know, steady, hold, and, you know, yeah, that, that kind of thing is, is literally to be prone and then engaging the iron side. You can, you can also just be crouching and it'll still be pretty good. If you're standing still, and you know, if you're moving, forget about it. You're not going to be able to hit. Yeah. By the way, on sprinting, you can now, you know, charge an attack. And you can still do the melee attack. You can still charge the melee attack. And yes, it does come in extremely handy if if you just run out of the bullets in the clip, or you're too close to where it just makes more sense to go melee instead. Yeah, you can now charge the melee attack or just, you know, use it regularly and sprint. And if you've already killed one soldier in that life, you will literally, like, shout out, you know, to, to scare off the others. And you can keep running. You can be running through several. And again, you could do that in real life, you know, if, if you're just manic enough, if you're that, you know gripped by the, the heat of battle, you can do that. And yeah, if you take them by surprise or you're close enough, it's extremely useful, but you're not invulnerable. You can still easily be shot down if they're not taken by surprise. So it's again one of these things where it can be extremely useful, but you have to use it at the exact right time. That goes for pretty much every tool you have in this game. Extremely useful, but use it at the right time or else. I suppose that pretty much covers the cover system. Now, as far as the prone and crouch goes, again, best system I've seen. I, I, I am willing to, to start and sign a petition, hand it over in person. This is how you do 
crouch prone. Two different keys for crouching prone. Crowning. If you want to go prone, it doesn't matter if you've already crouched or if you're standing up. Press the prone. Prone key. You're going into the yeah. If you you know if you're standing or prone, you just want to crouch. Press the crouch key. No matter what, it'll always have that effect. It always cycles between these two different states of, of you know these two positions, I suppose you'd say. And you can now, if you're if you're prone, you you can still you know rush ahead, sprint ahead, and then press the prone, and he will literally just dive down to the ground. You know, it'll take maybe half a second for you to hit the ground. Extremely useful. You can now also charge ahead and then go back to, to prone. If you're prone and you hold down sprint and forward, you will charge ahead until you let go of the two buttons. Then you'll dive to prone immediately again. And again, this is something that they would do in, you know, an extremely useful tactic in that kind of thing. And yeah, it's it's tremendously useful. Now, anytime you want to, whether you're in cover or not, you can always engage the iron sights. And these will make it a lot easier to, to aim. And you, you really don't want to aim without the iron sights. Basically, you know, iron sights, scope, something like that. And they do make you move a lot slower. And, and you know, again, we're used to, okay, move slower from, from proper aim. Yeah, literally a lot slower. And, and even so, you don't really want to be moving well because it's, you're not going to be able to aim as, as well as, yeah. Now, to, to get into the, the different game modes. This is a huge improvement because the first one really only had what I like to refer to as domination. Basically, you have to take all the different, you know, take or defend all the different points of the of the level, and then there's you know a time limit. In this one, you still have that mode. It's called territory. You also have modes like firefight. That has no Let's go with territories. That has no territories for you to take. The map is the is the same. Basically, you're not guided to what you wanna, you know, what territory you wanna occupy, which which is the place that you can most easily defend. And even so, have the enemy already gotten there? So do you need to like take it back from them? The game does not tell you what to you know what to do with this, but it's still there. If you want a good position in the in the level, yeah, you know, uh, a house that was easy to hold in in one of the other modes is still easy to hold. You know, a a a, a good position to attack a territory is still a good, but you do have to now figure it out for yourself. And the rounds are really short. I believe like three to five minutes. And the respawn, I think that can be up to 12 seconds. I, I think it's somewhat, I think, yeah, the, the respawn for that is, I think it's the same for the different respawns. It can be up to 12 seconds, which in Firefly also does mean that if everyone gets killed in short order, it's 12 seconds before anybody respawns. So, yeah. And it literally is just, kill as many as you can within the time limit. Now, then you have things like there is the there's the countdown mode where you have you're you're limited to one life per wave and there's like two waves to an objective. And this is essentially territory only like I said, only the two waves and the the rounds I think it's 3 minutes to an objective. If you don't. Uh, if if the attacking team does not capture an objective within the three minutes, the round is over. Then, then there's halftime. You swap sides. The 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 now attacking team has to you know top the previously attacking team's record. 
And yeah, if, if you keep taking them, you can end up taking every single one of these you know, territories and the, you know, the, the team that was defending now has to take over all of these in a slightly less amount of time, you know, counting, I believe, from the start of the last of these territories. Yeah. And then you have the regular territory, which, yeah, it's, it's essentially the same as what I just described for Countdown, only far more waves of, of reinforcements and much longer rounds. So, yeah. Then you have the... What's it called? I don't remember. It's Search and Destroy is the title. This is essentially the count, you know, Counter-Strike. One team has to get to an area and place a bomb. The other team has to you know, prevent the bomb from being placed and or explode. Then you have, yeah, and finally campaign mode, which it's essentially I think it's most like territory, only at the end of a of a round the attacking team gets to vote whether to be attacking or defending for the next round and choosing one of the of, of the levels, you know, you basically have a map, a, a tactical map. It'll show what you already have and what does the other side have. And yeah, you're basically trying to take the Eastern Front from the other team. And yeah, this, this is a fantastic idea. I, I take off my metaphorical hat to you, Tripwire, and Please keep making these. I, I, yes, I may actually have to check out Rising Storm. I, yeah. Now, so yeah, that covers the different game modes, and I suppose that brings me into the graphics are amazing. The you know, the first one they were good for the time. This one, I mean, this game is from 2012, I believe. The graphics hold up, and yeah, it's only two years later, but they're gonna keep holding up for at least a few more years. They, yeah, they, they look amazing and everything looks so true to life. There's, you know, the bloom effect where, you know, I mean, there's, there's always snow. It's, it's, it's essentially always overcast and or there's it it has snowed so you know ground floor, or it is snowing snow reflects light so yeah use that when when thinking of what's a good hiding place and what's you know what's a good hiding place for you what's a good hiding place for the enemy and then you have you know things like motion blur which and and you know noise that this starts out, starts out overpowering. It's going to take you a little while just to get used to, you know. And, and yeah, this is any time a gun is fired near you, whether an enemy or an ally. And, like, there's, there's not a damage indicator with, with arrows in this. If, if you're hurt, you're hurt. You, you don't necessarily know where. If you're hurt, you're one of the lucky ones. It means that the enemy didn't get a perfect shot in a, on you. You know, If you're shot in the torso with something that's not a pistol, you're probably dead. If, you, you know, if you're just hurt or you hear like ricochet, that means you're probably going to die in a few seconds, you know, maybe one second, if you don't immediately make yourself a tiny or non-existent target. But yeah, if it does have a directional indicator for where the noise comes from, basically. And yeah, this, again, this doesn't tell you whether it's an ally or an enemy, so you are literally just hoping that, you know, you, you may have to really Okay, was was that an ally or an enemy? You know, check out 
who was that in, in the basic... Yeah, it starts out quite overpowering. And, and other things that, you know, one of the first big challenges in this, you know, in, in these games has been pointed out as being how do you even tell enemies and allies apart? Like, you know, okay, obviously the the Soviets or the, the allies are in, in these yellow uniforms and sometimes will have this, this like, I guess you can call it a cap rather than the, the you know, steel bucket helmet thing. And yeah, the the Axis powers have the, the steel you know, helmet and gray uniforms. Yeah, but they don't always. There are ally forces that have the, the helmet and if it's not well lit, the color of the uniform is not going to be that obvious. Or if it's too well lit, again, bloom. And then, you know, okay, maybe you can go in for the, the symbol if you have the luxury of being able to see them from far away and you can take a second or two to be able to tell. Okay, so, yeah, you know, allied red star, Axis has the, the you know, steel cross. That's also not necessarily going to be so easy. Sometimes it's very, very hard to see. And if, you know, if you're up against a tank, for example, it's not there on every side. So, yeah. The... I suppose that brings me nicely to... You, you can't carry particularly many guns, again, yeah, realistically. You can carry one two-handed weapon and one one-handed weapon and then one, you know, grenade. Or sometimes, like, the engineer can also carry, in addition to a grenade, a, you know, an explosive. Of, yeah. And, yeah, you just have to make make do with that. And you can basically swap. I think in some of the, the rule sets you can pick up more than one weapon. But yeah, actually, briefly, the three rule sets, I'm not going to, you know, classic action, classic realism and action, I'm not going to detail how they're different from each other, because that would take forever. Basically, everything I say about the, the specifics of how difficult the game is, those are largely for classic. If you know, if we're talking realism, not all of them are there. If we're talking action, even less of them are there. Now, yes, so the the different guns, yeah, there there are different classes, and they tend to have the you know their their ideal uses. And and something like the anti-tank trooper is utterly helpless against anything that isn't a tank. You know, you really need to... He, he needs support pretty badly, not just emotionally. He is going to get killed if he goes up against anything other than that. You know, and most of these classes are limited. Some right down to one or two. I believe riflemen, you know, regular riflemen, is the only one that, you know, there can be as many players on that one as there need to be. But yeah, other than that, you might only have the one sniper, the one machine gunner, you know, the one squad leader. Now the squad leader can always give orders and if he has a radio, I I said the first one that is basically a chess game with no one having a complete overview. I would say roughly the same about this one except someone might have an overview. And that someone is a commander with a radio. He can call in aerial recon and it will literally show on the map that comes with the radio where the you know enemy units are. He can then have someone or himself place a you know an artillery marker and paint a target. And yeah, from from that it's Again, go to the radio, he can call in rockets, artillery, or mortar fire on that target. He can force respawn. Yeah, he's... Basically, there's, there's not much he can't as far as the overview and, and calling in support. 
four. Yeah. Now, I suppose that more or less covers the command. And, and in general, the commander can give orders. There's, I believe it's called a widget. I'm, I'm in the Stone Age of, of, you know, when it comes to technology. I, I just, you know, people can call or text my cell and my computer will play video games. That's essentially it. But yeah, it's a widget where, you know, you can tell them, follow me, defend this area, go there, attack this area, you know, and you can even choose what squad to send, you know, or whether to just send all of them. And yeah, it's extremely easy to use, and yeah, I don't have anything to say about that. You can also just straight up mark somewhere and tell the selected squad, go there or attack there. For the tank, the, the tank commander, note that when it comes to a tank, no one can use it other than the tank crewman and the tank commander. That's it. Because, you know, the others don't have the training for that. Now, yeah, so basically the tank commander, anything that, you know, might be useful, he can tell the tank to do. He, he's not even limited to his own tank. He can literally command the whole squad of tanks and, and tell them, you know, okay, this tank go there, this other tank go there. Brilliant. I... Tripwire, yeah, and he can he can literally with the directional keys he can order the tank you know full speed ahead stop you know go you know turn stop. again the bots are not exactly going to be a huge help in this respect but other players might be you know so yeah just. Avoid the bots some if if you can in this. That's yeah. Now the something I, I mentioned about the the first game in my review of that is there were not there were not that many servers still. This one does. Not all the rule sets necessarily have or you know not all the game modes have a ton, but you can find games um, you know in in this game. You can also set up games with, I believe it's called Steamworks. I'm, I have not had a ton of experience with Steamworks, but in this, you can share maps, you can set up your own matches, you know, choosing exactly what map, you know, choosing whether or not bots and how many. Yeah, basically all the, you know, server options are, are there for you. Mutators, I think, because you know this is an Unreal Engine, and I think that more or less covered. But you know, uh, other than that, obviously servers are dedicated, but you get to choose them. I, I feel I must mention that every single time that you actually, too many games do not allow. You. I I cannot tell you how annoyed I got with Assassin's Creed. Pick one by it not allowing you to choose a match, you know, because there are so many problems when you don't get to choose the match. This is, I mean, I'm still playing Max Payne 3. Don't ask me why. I must be a masochist. In those, in in these games, if you're, you know, quitting a, a match because maybe it has too hostile of of environment and you have the feels. Maybe it's you know maybe it has too few players and it ex it's extremely boring, you know whatever you don't really want to go back to that round. So when you go back to the, the menu, if it chooses that round again, it might do this several times. Yeah, frustrating. You know it might it might start a new dedicated match with only you as the player when if you check back after 30 seconds or something, it will actually have a match. And it's like, okay, if there's a match and I just can't join it right now, could you just tell me that it'll be 
ready in, in 30 seconds or something, you know, or if there are no matches, just tell me that. Don't don't start at you know a new server with just me. That's just gonna okay, that's um, now I'm nitpicking, but just yeah. Not choosing servers, bad. That's a very bad game developer. Yeah, so the I suppose that more or less covers the the guns. Actually, I should say a sniper in a tower is a force to be reckoned with in this, and a machine gunner, like in real life, can literally mow down enemy soldiers. You know, you you don't want to just run them. If you're running out in the open, you are doing it wrong. You know, playing this game, you are doing it wrong. You you have got to you know, constantly use cover and really be aware of where are your allies, where are your enemies, what are they using, you know, you know, what how many bullets left in my gun, all this stuff. And the machine gun literally yeah, it's it's extremely powerful, but if you're not using it right, yeah. You have to, you know, some of the machine guns you can fire without bracing them. But you don't even want to know how bad the the aim is going to be. No, you want to brace it, and for that you need like cover or you need to be prone. And once you've braced it, yeah. By, by the way, bracing always has an icon, so you know whether you're ready to brace, whether you are bracing. I'm running out of ways to say how much I love this game. Yeah, basically, <laughs> once you brace the machine gun. It has a 90 degree angle, so if you braced it at the wrong angle, or if you, you know, if you're in a position that it's going to take you a little while to unbrace and either rebrace in a different angle or, you know, move to a different location. So yeah, you want to pick the right location, pick the right angle, then brace, unbrace, and get ready to to mow them down. You know, and in this game, you can actually check the, you know, how many bullets are left in the clip. It's, you know, in the first one, I'm pretty sure you couldn't do this in the first one. In the first one, as in this, you you are told when you put in a new clip, new clip is like full or you know, you know, more than half empty. I'm I'm not sure it ever tells you less than half it it might you know it it's it's both an optimist and a pessimist in in that regard yeah because you won't throw away any clip that has at least one bullet left you know you may want to you know reload but you're going to put that thing back in the belt because it's a clip it still has at least one round it's not useless it's so yeah after you've used several clips it might tell you New clip is almost empty, you know. So yeah, in this one you can check the clips mostly. I think there are a few where you can't. Where literally, yeah, you know, he'll open the clip, take a peek, put it back, and then he'll tell you the clip is so and so, you know, almost empty, so and so, you know, almost full. All this stuff, huge difference in yeah. And again, it's it's a new thing. It doesn't make it too easy. It just it furthers the original vision of this. So, so yeah. Now the 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 levels tend to be ruins of you know, like you know I Pavlov's house is a really good example of basically bombed out buildings and. The only thing left is the, the floors themselves and the call the the door frames, because those are what can survive, you know, all these blasts. So, yeah, it, it looks like an apple core, if if that's the word, you know, something like that. And it's it's just it's a striking visual, and it's completely true to life, you know. And and I believe also in Powell's house, you have these. Tram, car, you know, where the the you know the the tracks themselves have have you know some of them or at least have come up. You know, my, my father, who's quite the expert on on war stuff, 
pointed out maybe it's from bombings, maybe it's just it was so hot that they, you know, got, yeah. And like tram cars will be standing, maybe lying on the side close to it, you know, all these these details that betray that there was life here before this this war. You know, there, there you know, like in the first, you might find some farm animals who were dead around farms, and it's like, was the, did the farmer kill it mercifully, you know, knowing he couldn't take it with him? Did he kill it just so the, you know, the invading force would not be able to take, you know, take advantage of his farm animals? You know, was it killed? You know, did did they come and take the farmer and the farm animal ran wild and then they killed it? Did they just kill it to make an example? Yeah, you know, it, it provokes all these thoughts and, you know, not everyone will necessarily think so deeply about it, but it's, it's one of those games where you get from it what you bring to it in, you know, somewhat. And what, you know, at its core, what it puts right there in front of you is just real life recreated. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it puts you right there with an interactive documentary at an, at a part of our relatively recent history that, you know, historically speaking, that we really shouldn't forget what we learned from, what we learned from it. In addition to that, I, I, should, may, I should point out, the game is never exploitative, which is always, you know, whenever you have violence and, and death and stuff like that, it's always, okay, is it exploitative? I'm not, again, exploitation, cinema, and, and gaming, to each his own. I might, you know, I sometimes enjoy it too, but I do think it's very admirable when a game says, no, no exploitation here, we're just going to, you know, be extremely honest. It's, it's like a camera. The camera does not lie. You might not like what the camera tells you, but it does not lie. It does add 10 pounds, but the basic, yes, and, and one more thing on the, the, the ruins, the, you know, appearance-wise, there are these buildings that have burned to the ground, and the one thing left standing is the, the, the chimney, because that, that wouldn't burn entirely. And, you know, and in that same level, you also have houses that are still on fire or houses that have burnt partly, partially to the ground. Yeah. And, and these ruins, you know, they may be abandoned. They may be hiding enemies, you know. There's a bit of, you know, a, a fair amount of close quarter combat in this, and it gets very chaotic at times. You know, there's, I believe it's it's Pavel's house. You fight from one floor to the next, and it literally is. And and again, my father confirmed this for me. Yes, he is. He is my main res research resource when it comes to to war stuff. Literally, there were. You know, there might be Germans on one floor and then Russians on the next. And supposedly there were then Germans up on the floor about you know, that basic idea. He, he wasn't entirely certain if that was, you know, the case. But but still, fighting floor to floor, and that's in this game. So, yeah. Now, the... I suppose that more or less covers that. Now it's very much urban warfare. I should also say single player is, you know, these single player levels, it's all territory slash countdown, you know, it's of, of the game modes that I described earlier. Now, in addition, of, as far as the, the gruesome realism, the, the gore in this game is truly horrifying. I, I'm not squeamish. I, you know, some of my favorite, you know, some of my best friends, you know, some of my favorite games and movies 
have an extreme amount of violence. I, the thing is not about the, the brutal violence, but it does have some extremely brutal violence. I love that movie, you know. But in this game, it is so real. Like, you may just see, like, the, the bloody stumps that used to be legs or arms of your your own body, if you, you know, or a, a buddy of yours from, from an explosion nearby. And I, playing this, I literally considered turning off the, the gore, or at least, you know, turning it some down. Yeah. It was that bad. That no other game has had that you know effect on me at no point. That I, or or a movie for that matter. I've never been like, okay, I'm gonna watch this, but I better just be watching, you know, a a, a censored one because I cannot handle all the yeah, that gives you an idea of yeah. This has a a, a tactical view which it's sort of a shortcut to the map and it gives you a a quick over you know not overview a, a quick indication of where are you what is exactly going on where is the closest resupply station radio target you know and the map is what gives you the overview but the you know the yeah the the tactical view extremely useful and again it doesn't make it too easy it just allows them to ramp up how intense it is or maybe rather it allows you to better follow how intense it is it, it makes it more playable not easier you know and the first one did it is almost too you know I mean both of these games do Add in some things that you maybe have to, you know, keep trying. And besides, think of it as, you know, just from memory or from basic, you know. I mean, you can always check the map, and that's all. Also, always, you know, you're not pulling out the map. It's just, you know, because the pull-out method is not always entirely dependable. You are just checking the map. Just one, you know, press the key. You know, press the key again to toggle it. You know, immediately. And the tactical view is kind of that, but without obscuring your view with the map. So, yeah, you can really quickly get an idea of where am I supposed to go, or you know, where am I going to go? You know, cue the Red Butler response. And yeah, it is extremely useful. And I. I suppose that more or less covers the tactical view. Now, the and and yeah, in general, there are a couple of things you know where it betrays being game. Very few, but a couple. Not enough to to actually bother enough that it's playable. You know, you on on the map or in the tactical view, there's a being captured, you know, icon, and the, you know, sometimes if you're really close to an ally, it might show the name above, you know. Now, I suppose that more or less covers that. Now, one thing that's also a bit annoying about single players Saving can be really awkward. Like it's all checkpoint saving, but it might it might save early in the new level rather than at the end of the one you've just completed. So yeah, until I figured this out, I had to replay levels several times. And again, when it's these really bad tutorials, when it when a tutorial isn't excellent, it is really frustrating. You know, and, and that goes in general, because then you are just trying desperately to live up to things that the game needs you to do, you know, in a row where it's like, okay, now do this, now do that. 
and maybe some of these things are extremely difficult to actually accomplish. And it's like, okay, I get that I'm going to need to be able to do this later on in the game, but by that point, maybe I'll have had time to practice, or it'll be just the one thing. You know, it won't be, you know, these practice things. Let's say you have to do three things in a row that are all complicated. When you get further along in the game, it's not going to necessarily be all these three complicated things in a row. Now, but but yes, the um, I suppose that pretty much covers the the saving. Now, I think that hmm, I suppose that more or less covers it. The let's see, there is a hmm, actually the, the HUD is quite minimal. Again, there's the tactical view, which yeah, gives you a little bit of and that you know that's added to the HUD. You know, like I said, it's not is not bringing up the map. Now you do you know when the only thing that's always there in the in the HUD is the compass, and when affected, it will show stamina, the you know whether you're crouched or prone, and how many extra clips. You know if you're reloading, it'll say okay now you have X amount of clips left. If you're going to prone or crouch, or, you know out of either of those it'll show the, the icon, and when you're sprinting, yeah, it'll, it'll show stamina. And I don't remember if I've already said, but definitely bears repeating, if you run out of stamina and you bring up your rifle, don't even bother. It's, you're not going to be able to hit anything. And, you know, and, and for that, you can also, it doesn't give you that much zoom, and, you know, again, which... We've kind of gotten used to that in first-person shooters and the like. In this, it really doesn't. You can always control breath, you know, provided you didn't, you know, you didn't sprint so much that yeah. And yeah, it'll take a deep breath for a little bit. And if you're not bracing by the time you exhale, it'll completely mess up your aim. So the I suppose that more or less covers that, the the bracing and the yeah. So and and yeah, obviously controlling your you know steadies the the gun even further. Now, even though there is a an option for you know. For getting orders in like English, I would presume you know you can turn off native voices. As far as I could tell, it always remained I, like when someone is you know shouting something you know uh, arousing speech at the start of a single player level, possibly multiplayer levels, but but yeah, it will be in English. But the the orders you give still will be in, in Russian or German. And that's good for realism, but it does also mean that you always have to check the subtitles, which, yeah, is a little annoying to, to have to... Yeah, it again... It's one of those things that could have been fixed and, you know, just add to how much you have to keep track of in this game. Now, you... The let's see, I wanted to mention yes, the as your guns gain experience, you you know they will increase in rank and and so will you yourself, which you know it it you know, sino, it shows that you've been playing it for a long time. And with the guns, it also means that after a while you can upgrade them, and this, you know, will mean something like putting a silencer on or increasing clip size, attaching a bayonet. So things that aren't out 
of the realm of, of you know, believability, probability, other ability, but actually, you know, reward having played for a long time, which the first, you know, like something like Left 4 Dead. The first in Left 4 Dead, if you played for 10 minutes or 10 hours, you can't necessarily tell the difference because anything the game might give you, you can get in just the first level or so. You know, once you've played the different levels, you've seen all there is to see. In this game, yeah, you'll, you'll get to upgrade these, yeah. Now, I suppose that might more or less cover it, actually. The... It would appear so. Now, you you do not carry very much spare ammo, and I think you have like three bandages, you know, when when you start a new life, you know, because I mean, I think I can speak for all of us when I say I ain't got time to bleed. And the the atmosphere is amazing and completely absorbing. Like you you know, you, you completely disappear into this game, into the simulation of the real warfare that, you know, took place. Now, that does appear to be it. I, I should mention that for, for the tank, turning the, the, the cannon is a slow and noisy endeavor. So you want to be economical about that. You know, you really want to, yeah. And the, the, the tank has, I think it's three or four seats, and each of them has a very specific role. Like, only the driver can actually drive. And, and the driver, you can actually look around the cockpit, and you can see the other guys in there. And you know, you can see the extra shells for the, the cannon and, and these kinds of things. But yeah, the driver is the only one to drive. The gunner is the one who runs the cannon and such. And by the way, reloading also takes two and a half seconds or so. So don't miss. And sometimes he'll also control, if, if there is a coaxial machine gun, you know, it, it's, it's basically attached to the, the can of the tank. And there might also be a machine gunner in the, yeah. And I think that pretty well covers what I wanted to say about that. Now, the... I should also note that the, the upgrading also goes for the different classes of, I think it's, yeah, you're, you're like unlocking more guns for that class. Now, I suppose, that one, oh, and actually, for the vehicles, th there is also, you know, you, there's also APC, which I think it's like six people can be in there. And then there's a driver and a machine gunner. And whether you're a machine gunner and an APC, actually, whenever you're, you know, whenever you have a real role in either of the vehicles, if you're not just sitting in an APC lazily, you, you have several different views, two or three. And the more exposed, the better of a view you also have of your surroundings. So, again, you don't never want to use it, but you don't want to use it in the wrong situation. But, like, if you're just, if you're far away from the battle, and you're sure you're far away from the battle, and you just want a, a good overview, yeah, you'll, you'll want to go for the most exposed one. Now, as I've already said, I appreciate that 
you know, these two games are not for everyone. They are, I mean, if you don't want a simulation, if you want to just have fun with, with your shooters, and again, I mean, I play the Max Payne games. I, you know, yeah, I too want to have fun with with these. So, yeah, if you aren't into simulation, you know, there were people who just did not feel up to playing Red Orchestra 1. And, you know, not everyone will go above and beyond Call of Duty 2. I have no right to make that comparison. I've never played a Call of Duty game. I just thought it was a clever wordplay. I've reviewed other parts of this series. The links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.